So we're talking tonight, uh, if you all saw the social media promotion or you can see there on your notes, uh, it's called Dressed and Ready and What Would You Wear to Meet God? And so uh, that's just kind of an interesting uh, thought. Like if you, there, I'm sure you all have had those dreams where like you're at work or something, you're in pajamas or, uh, I always find it weird. My kids have like theme days at school and they're like just eager to go be in their pajamas. I'm like, like that's not embarrassing or awkward at all. You're saying no, okay, all right, it's just me. Uh, but you all have had instances maybe where you're going to go uh, meet somebody um, that's important and uh, you have to go get dressed up. I had a job where um, when we met with certain bosses, we always had to have a tie and a sports jacket. But for our regular job, we didn't. So I'd have to go with like um, a dress shirt and dress pants every day. And then I just had a locker that I kept a tie and a sports jacket in. And you just hope that it matches what you're wearing that day. But um, if we had a meeting, then I would just throw that on real quick. And it's like, all right, I got to go meet this important person and uh, wear this uh, very specific thing. Uh, so, so you could probably relate to that. And if we thought about um, if I were going to meet God, what would I want to wear? And that may not be something you care about or think about, but you'll see why I'm, I'm talking about that uh, in a second. So to begin, I want to first just ask um, about our punctual and not punctual people. So let's see, let's start with punctual people, meaning on time. A uh, little confession before we get started. Punctual people, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, you all can put it down. So that... I'm just estimating, I would say 37% of the room, maybe to 43 in that range. Pretty accurate estimator. Um, all right, let's see non-punctual people. Non-punctual, you're like, I just show up when I show up. All right, so that is like 24% of the room. That means we're missing a good percentage. And I feel pretty confident about my estimations there. So... So we have some people who, like, they're just the type of person that they're going to be on time. Maybe they're even early. And then there's other people who they're, like, always behind. And maybe they feel like it's because they're busier than everybody else. But in reality, they just generally don't plan to be on time. And maybe they pack their calendar too full. And um, there's everybody's going to be late sometimes. But if you're just the always perpetual late person, um, then, then maybe it's not you know, time itself, that's the problem. Maybe, maybe it's you. Um, someone disagrees. Someone's like, we'll talk, we'll talk afterwards. We'll, we'll sort this. <laughs> I, my wife and I had this one time where uh, we, we were supposed to have dinner with this couple. And so we show up at this restaurant and I'm talking, this couple was 45 minutes to an hour late. And we're just like, did they cancel? And so she would like text them, yeah, we're on our way. Like, okay, like that's a long time to be late. And then when they showed up, it wasn't like, oh, we're so sorry, we made you wait. It's just like, hey, how you guys doing? It's like, well, like 45 minutes ago, I was pretty good. Now, now I'm a little, less. we didn't say that, we were gracious, but, but we were thinking it, like it was in our heads. All right, so we're gonna talk about um, we're going to talk about punctuality, we're going to talk about being late, things like that, and we're going to talk about the, um, I guess, kind of the um, limiting of time, and so I want to ask this, maybe this would be a fun question for you, I've thought about it before, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, if you only had like, like a few weeks or maybe a year, just a short amount of time to live, what are some things that you would make sure that you got to do? So I'll give you a second to think, keep it, keep it G-rated for me. Um, <laughs> Tell those other ones to God and he'll convict you. But uh, for the group, for the group, uh, let's just think about that. What are some things? When you, got, when you got one, raise your hand, I'll call on you. Say it again. Travel. Travel. Okay. Anywhere specific? Italy. All right. Travel to Italy. That'd be neat. And once you're in Europe, you might as well just like fly over all over on uh, Ryanair or uh, use, the, use the train and go all sorts of places. You can see all sorts of cool places. Skydive. Skydive so that you can expedite the death process. <laughs> this is a good call. Is that what you meant? No? Yeah, skydiving, that's something I do not want to do. But. Say it again. Oh, cage diving? No cage. It's like, you shouldn't do it, 
So if you all find out that you're going out of this world, you're like, let's go ahead and just do some things. It's awesome, like, to be eaten by a shark is not awesome. What? All right. We're going to enter some counseling sessions after this tonight, I can already tell. Go ahead. All right, everybody, listen up. Oh, don't, get, don't get too harsh on them. Listen up for Ben. Love him, Chris. Love him. All right, go ahead. Go to as many concerts as humanly possible. Yes. Lots of concerts. All right, lots of concerts. Olin, I think I saw your hand. Did I? Yes, you did. Everybody's sassy right now, man. We need to reopen in prayer. <laughs> go ahead. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, Chris. Chris, give me a hug, brother. Come on. Come on. We got to be patient with people. Let's love them. We want to have fun, all right? All right, so let's understand this, though. You want to, you want to tell everybody and then gauge their reaction toward what end? Like, what's your goal in this? So you don't have a goal in mind. You just know that that's what I want to do. I, I'm trying to process this. Like, I don't know what my human experiment is, but I'm going to conduct one. I'm just going to see what emotion. I don't get that, but okay. Hey, it's your last days. You do what you want. Go ahead. Say again. Get married. All right. Interest, interesting choices. Get married. All right. All right, Grace, go ahead. oh that's awesome that is so evil so if y'all didn't hear drop out of school (laughs) quit her job I was going to comment on that but then the day before text 10 other people say if you don't pass this on you're going to die wow that is (laughs) that (laughs) I don't know what to think about you all you all are crazy that is that is something all right go ahead Chris all right uh, this is something that that I have always wanted to do ever since I was seven, and and I had to wait until I was 18 to be able to do it, but even after I turned 18, I never got to do it, so I'm hoping to do it before. This is so much buildup. I'm so excited. <laughs> what, what is this thing? I want to be a contestant on The Price is Right. That's what I'm talking about. There we go. That's good stuff. <laughs> That's good stuff. Man, that could have gone anywhere. It could have gone anywhere. Price is right. All right. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm so glad I asked this question. Like, I'm going to play this video back, and I'm going to analyze you all so much. Go ahead. Say it a little louder for me. Just a second. What? Oh, go on a mission trip. Oh, awesome. Good one. There we go. There we go. All right. Like men in black type outfits. <laughs> they show up with sunglasses and And have a little ear wire thing. Yeah. All right. That's creative, too. What we got? Since you're going to die anyways, make your own superhero suit. Go become a superhero. So, all right. Go become a superhero. And so, like, and do what? Like, fight crime? Or are you talking about, like, try to do the Spider-Man jump from one building to another where... Build your own web shooters. You should do that anyways if you know how. But <laughs> all right, all right, good stuff. All right, one more. Go see a show on Broadway. Okay. Which show in particular? Which show in particular? Chris wants to know. All of them. All of them that you're able to. All of them. I was hoping he was going to say either Cats or Hamilton. <laughs> 
Cats or Hamilton? All right, you all thought a lot about this, so I knew I wasn't the only one. Um, Grace has the best one. I mean, you all were good. Grace was like so maniacal. That was like, we all learned a little something about her today, and I am, I am glad we did. Um, she sent it. Oh. Oh, that's a good point. Coach found a flaw in your theory. You could only send it to nine people. So, like, you fell short, and that's why you died. And you could even, like, stop mid text if you want. Like, half the text, half the text, and then it just drops off. And people are like, oh, I guess, like, it was exactly 24 hours or something. I don't know. All right. Interesting stuff, people. All right, so we're in Romans chapter 13. I promise I had a reason, although, man, that, that was just interesting stuff. Uh, so we're in Romans chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 11 in a second, and we're going to talk about um, the urgency God wants to see. Like, if, if you or I found out that we're going to have a, like a shortened lifespan, it's not going to be, I mean, our lifespans are short anyways uh, compared to even physical things that we know in this world, but compared to eternity, it's so short. Um, but if we find out that it's abridged even more than that, then there's going to be different things that we want to do. So like when I was in college, the uh, Harry Potter series was coming out and, and I had this thought, I was like, man, if I were to die before the last book is released, that would be disappointing. So if I did like a make a wish type thing, I'd be like, fly me over there, have her tell me, have JK Rowling tell me how it ends, right? As I've grown up, I have a little more serious ones, right? I'd want to... Um, like maybe record some videos for my kids and uh, spend time with them, spend time with my wife. Um, I have all sorts of books I want to write that I don't always take the time to do. I'd like to finish those, right? So we all have different things that we'd like to do if we knew like there's a little urgency behind it, that, that our time in this physical body were shortened. And so with that in mind, we have a thought, but I wonder if we think about God's view about the urgency that we should have, especially in relation to time. So we're going to go ahead and get into this. Let's look at Romans chapter 13, if you would. Turn your Bibles there. And uh, Romans chapter 13, we're going to start in verse 11. So look at verse 11 with me, if you would. Romans chapter 13, verse 11, it says this. Besides this, since you know the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep, because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. I'm going to read again. Besides this, since you know the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep, because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So I'm going to have three rhetorical questions I'm going to ask you tonight. So uh, I'm not going to do a whole lot more discussion tonight. Um, but I want to ask you this first. If God said to you, wake up, like if he's saying that to you, what might he be talking about? This is rhetorical. I want you to think about yourself tonight. So we've talked about urgency. If you felt there's some urgency to your life, then you have things you'd want to do. But if God is saying to you all these different things, the time, the hour, salvation is near. If, if God said to you, you need to wake up right now, you need to wake up, then I want you to think about in your life what that might mean. What things are you kind of just drifting along, floating along, and I'm speaking spiritually specifically, what kind of things that God would care about are you just, you're letting them go or they're just fine? And if God said, it's the time to wake up. So he starts off, look at verse 11 again, he says, besides this. So the question, of course, as you're trying to uh, develop your interpretive habits, the first question you should ask is, besides what? He says, besides this, well, besides what? So that's talking about all the different things he's covered in chapters 12 and 13, um, besides all of these different things. So if you recall, or uh, people who are new here, kind of the outline of the book of Romans is chapters 1 through 11 are all his argument, the Apostle Paul's argument, about our need for salvation through the grace of God and through faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so he says, look at chapter 12, if you turn there really quickly. These are some of the verses I had the, the uh, Tyler and Reese read tonight. Chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, so those mercies of God, that's what chapters 1 through 11 are about. 
That's how he's summarizing what it's about. That I'm a sinner and I need salvation through Jesus Christ. So I deserve death and uh, both physical death, but also spiritual death. But God has sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die in my place so that I didn't have to die and that I could have eternal life. And so he just summarizes and says, in view of these mercies of God, and he says, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. So then he goes on about how we're to be a living sacrifice. So it's one thing to say I would die for God. It's another thing to say I'll live for God. And so he begins to tell us how he wants us to live for him. And so he starts off in verse 3. I'm not going to read all these, but in verse 3, he starts talking about our obligation as Christians. So your obligation as a Christian to a church. It is, it's not enough to just come consume and uh, hear some good messages, hear a song. A Christian is called to engage in the body. God has gifted you uniquely. You may not think he has, but scripture says he has. Therefore, I believe it, not you, right? Um, so scripture says you have been uniquely gifted and he places you in his body. That's what he calls the church. He, he says it like um, there's not just... Uh, there's not just individual parts. You're part of a, an overall organism known as Christians, known as a church. And God has gifted you in a way that you provide something unique to a local body of Christians that you're supposed to give to them. Right, Whatever giftedness you have, if it's just encouragement, if it's uh, time, if it's uh, whatever, I don't know. God, God can give you whatever gift He wants to give you, and He says use it through your local church. And so then in verse 9, he goes on to talk about just Christian ethics. He has, uh, I'll read verse 9, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what's good. Or if you go down to uh, verse 19, look halfway through, he says, Vengeance belongs to me, I will repay, says the Lord. And so verse 21, look at that with me. Chapter 12, verse 21, he says, Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Okay, so he's talking about Christian ethics, how we're to react to other people. So he said, don't be conformed. Uh, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We say how. One, by how you act in the church. Two, by your Christian ethics to other people. Now look at chapter 13, verse 1. 13, verse 1 says, Let everyone submit to the governing authorities. I'm not going to re-argue that case, but he tells us how we're supposed to submit to governing authorities. So authority is something that's from God. Now some people abuse authority, of course, but authority itself is a good thing. And we certainly have a generation that doesn't like the idea of authority, partially because it's been abused so much, but the idea of authority itself is a godly thing. Um, so he talks about government authorities. Look at chapter 13, verse 8. Verse 8, he says, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. And so he goes through a description about loving your neighbor as yourself, and you fulfill the law that way. So he's talked about all these different things. Chapters 1 through 11 are about the doctrine of salvation, a, a theological argument for why we need to be saved and how we can be saved. But then in chapter 12, he starts off by saying, and so now here's the practical side. Since you're saved, here's how you live. And so he's given us these different things like love, like government, like the church, like Christian ethics. So now if you look back at Romans chapter 13, verse 11 with me, he says, besides this. So besides all the things that I just said, I've got something else for you. He says, since you know the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So uh, I just highlight a few things for you. He talks about the time, the hour, and that salvation is nearer than when we first believed. These are all, these are all references to time. Now, as people try to interpret what does this mean, you could be talking about end times type things like, um, like well, how come Jesus isn't here today? Why isn't, um, why isn't he returned yet? How long do we have to wait? And if Paul thought um, he, he should be coming back soon, then how come all these years later, we're still waiting for him. So that's, what, uh, that's one interpretation. Another interpretation is simply that um, because Jesus Christ had come at that time, he, he'd come in the, the flesh, died on the cross, that there was a time of darkness, that now it was turning into a time of light. Meaning, not that there won't be bad things in the world, but now it's a time of light because the gospel message is here. So either way, though, he says... The time is here to wake up from sleep. Now, I wonder, uh, I asked you this, just kind of a rhetorical, if God said to you, wake, wake up. Like if he's saying to you, if he calls out your name, let's say you go home tonight, you're in bed, and, and God's like, it's time for you to wake up in life. Like, like maybe you're, you're saying your prayers as you, you go to sleep, and all of a sudden God just speaks to your heart. He's like, it is time to wake up. 
I want you to think specifically about what he would be saying to you. Like, I, I dare say that we don't have to have the God of the universe reveal to us the, the places we've been asleep in our spirituality, right? Now, when we think of waking up, it's interesting how different people do different things. If we could just kind of go back to real world for a second and not the spiritual world. Uh, I was thinking of, of my kids when I thought about this. Um, we're thinking tonight about what you'd wear before God and waking up uh, before God. And so it just reminded me of like the daily struggle of getting kids ready for school, right? <laughs> so some of you are punctual, and so you wake up early in the morning. You're probably morning people, um, or at least you've made yourself become morning people. I dare say oftentimes people who run behind are the night owls, and they think better at night. I'm, I'm one of those. I like, I like nighttime. I just, there's less interruptions, less distractions. Uh, I was there was a period in my life where it was a very tired period, but it was one of the most productive ever is when I worked night shift. I just, I got all sorts of things done uh, and I loved it. But I was thinking about my kids and just how different even our kids are. So um, my daughter, she's gonna get up. She may, um, she may do chores before we get up sometimes. Like she's just that type. Man, the boys, my two boys, they are in bed until we get them out of bed, unless it's an inconvenient time where me and my wife actually got to sleep in, and then they're gonna be up like playing Xbox and yelling at each other like, it's Saturday, it's 6 a.m., what are you doing awake? But, but on a school day, man, you can't get them out of bed. They'll come down and they'll just look like, like they stayed up all night and maybe got beat up through the night, and they're, <laughs> they're like sitting there on our, uh, our little cereal island area, and they're like, like, you know that face where someone's like, I'm not faking being tired. Like, this is real, and my brain is not fully here right now, and it's just kind of torture to be awake. So they'll sit there like that. Of course, they don't go to bed. Like, they know how terrible they feel in the morning, but by the next night, they've already forgotten that because they're not going to go to bed good. Like, <laughs> I'll just walk in there sometimes. Uh, we'll hear... They think we can't hear them. I don't know what it is about kids. They think we can't hear them. So me and my wife would be downstairs, and we hear, like, all this thunking upstairs. Like... Unless your kid falls out of bed, then when it's sleep time, there shouldn't be any thunking upstairs. Like, it should be just quiet. And so I'll go upstairs. I'll sneak. Yeah, I can sneak. I'm fairly good at it. How dare all of you who thought I couldn't. But um, So I'll sneak upstairs. I'll, like, crack open the door. And there will be, like, a little kid in his underwear. And he'll be like, <laughs> like, just as terrified. And then sometimes I love it. They're always like, I'm sorry. Like, they'll just scream that out. And I'm like, nope, too late. <laughs> so... So uh, I, I may sometimes make them uh, put their hands on the wall and do a little spank. Or what I have, what I have uh, started to enjoy, I've mentioned this uh, to you all before, I love to make my kids do bear crawls. And, uh, and like, hey, if you got energy, let's just do some bear crawls back and forth. And, and so let's wear you out. And they'll do some, they'll be whining and stuff. It's like, hey, you had energy. Let's get all this stuff out right now. And then uh, they'll, they'll get up, they'll be like breathing hard and stuff. It's like, you got any more energy? You, you want a little more? And so, you know, they're like, no. And like that sad face. And they'll, they'll finally go to bed. Um, who knows how late. Um, but, but then in the morning, they're exhausted, right? So sometimes people just don't want to wake up. Right? Sometimes people are just like, uh, man, we know it's good for us. We know we should go to bed. We know we should wake up. But we just don't want to, right? Same thing spiritually. And then sometimes people scoff. Like sometimes people will see something like this. Look at verse 11 again when it says, Besides this, since you know the time, it's already the hour for you to wake up from sleep because now our salvation is near, nearer than when we first believed. And look at verse 12. I'll just read the first part. He says, The night is nearly over and the day is near. Sometimes Christians have this skepticism toward when God will return. Like, now sometimes people overdo it. Sometimes people have such an American mindset where they're like, oh, it's very clear that God's going to return at any moment. And I'm just like, hold up a second. Like, you may preach that the world is ending, but then you're like going to a buffet after church. Like, the world ain't that bad. When you compare it to like First and Second Thessalonians, and, and they were under real persecution, they may have seen their friend like get eaten by a lion at the Colosseum, right? I mean, that, that, I, I can understand where they're like, the end is near. I'm not saying it's not near. I'm just saying there's been worse times than this. There's been rougher times. We're sitting here. It's hot outside, but it's air conditioning. We got some pasta and breadsticks and dessert. And, like, the world's not that bad right now. I'm just, I'm just saying that. I'm not saying Jesus ain't coming tomorrow. I'm just saying don't be so hasty in your proclamations of when he's coming back, right? Uh, think about that. 
But oftentimes, people are the other way. Oftentimes, they're like, if the Apostle Paul is writing in Romans chapter 13, verse 11 and 12, that the day is near, okay, well, where is he? That was like 2,000 years ago. Like, why is he not here? What are we waiting for? How, how long are we going to wait? So I want to just speak to that or actually let the Bible speak to it. So on your notes, if you'd uh, open them up and look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 3 says this. Above all, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing and following their own desires, saying, where is his coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. So that's, we can understand that, right? We can understand like, oh yeah, Jesus, he died and ascended uh, like 2,000 years ago. What's happened since then? And how long will we go? Like if we end up being a civilization that's like multi-planetary and we go hundreds of years into the future, are we still going to believe in this Jesus thing? Are we, are we still going to believe in that? And it's this type of scoffing that this is referencing to. So look, um, look at verse 5. They deliberately overlook this. By the word of God, the heavens came into being long ago, and the earth was brought about from water and through water. Through these, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. Now I want you to just pause there and understand what that means. He's describing creation, uh, the from the water, uh, in the water. There's a lot of water if you read Genesis chapter 1. But what he's saying is, what they're missing is this. The very ability to reason, their very existence, is only because God intervened at one time. right? The, their reality, the ability to question or even scoff, is only because there is a God who made them so, and He did so by intervention. And look at the next part says, verse, uh, verse 7, By the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. I want you to hear that tonight. As we think of why hasn't God come back, as we think of uh, Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12, when it says the time, the hour, salvation is near, the night is nearly over, the day is near. To us, it sounds like, how could the Apostle Paul write that? Because it doesn't feel like it's close. And what he's saying here in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, is understand this, God is outside of time. He doesn't operate on the same scale that we do. The very ability to reason only happens because He gave it to us. That there was a time in history when He interceded in, in the physical world and said, let there be this and there was this. Let there be that and there was that. Let there be everything and it came to be. That He spoke the whole earth and the heavens and everything in them into existence because He intervened. And He says, there's another intervention that is going to come. So when we scoff and we say, man, where is God? Like 2,000 years have passed. How, how much longer are we going to wait before we believe this type of thing is real? He says, realize this, there is another intervention coming. Before it was water, and next is fire. And when you see fire in Scripture, it's talking about judgment. So look what it says. Look at verse 8 again. He says, dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. But verse 9 is the point. The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Do you hear that? Why He's waiting. Like if you're getting impatient, it's because God's waiting for souls. Like Scripture, scripture didn't just write that in there because we've been tired of waiting. This was back then, written back then, saying God is outside of time. You may be getting impatient, but to him, a day, a thousand years wasn't matter. He's waiting for people to come to know him. That's his purpose, because he has intervened before. Your very existence proves it, and he's going to intervene again, and when he does, it's going to be fire and judgment. And so he doesn't want a person to come to fire and judgment. So what he's doing is he's waiting, saying, come to know me, because look at the next part, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. 
On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it will be disclosed or destroyed. Verse 11, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness. As you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming, because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. And I, I referenced a lot of other passages that you could look up on your own time if you want. But here what he's saying, because we know this certainty, because we know that God intervened in the past and our very existence is proof of that, and because we know that he's going to intervene again and how he's going to intervene again is through fire and judgment. Because of that, he said, it is clear what manner of people you ought to be. So there's two types of people in this room tonight. There's a lost person. There's a saved person. There's a person who's given their life to Christ and there's a person who hasn't. And he has something to say to both. Because the time is short, and you say, well, the time doesn't seem very short. Okay, maybe, maybe Christ's not going to return in your lifetime, but at the end of your lifetime, you'll go meet him. Right? One, one way or the other, the time is short for you. And even if you have 60 to 80 years left, that's short when you compare it to eternity. And what he's saying to you, because there is a certain day where we will face God and where even all of creation will be dissolved by fire, by judgment, because of that, he's saying, you ought to live for him. And if you're lost, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, that means you need to surrender to him. That means you need to say, I am a sinner. I believe that my sin separates me from a holy God, but I believe he died in my place and rose again. And so I give my life to him and ask him to save me. But then there's Christians. Right? There's Christians who, man, sometimes we don't live like Christians. Sometimes we're people asleep. So going back to Romans chapter 13, verse 11, he says, besides this, look at verse 11 with me. Since you know the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. That's what I want you to hear. Like as we just look at this first verse, because you know the time, I have it on your notes there for you. Since you know the time, wake up. Since you know the time, wake up. Like hear this truth today that there is a God who has intervened in the past and will intervene in the future, and he is saying to Christians, wake up. He is saying to lost people, wake up and know me. Christians, wake up and live for me. And so my question to you, I repeat this rhetorical question, if God were to say to you, wake up, what is it? If he's saying to you, wake up, what's he talking about? I'm not asking for you to tell me. I'm asking for you to think of it right now. There are people in here tonight who have never trusted Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior, and he's saying, wake up, I'm real. Wake up, come to know me, come to follow me, come to serve me. To Christians, to you, he's saying, wake up. There may be things that you should be doing, you're not. There may be things you're not doing, or that you are doing, that you shouldn't be doing, things you need to give up in your life. God in heaven is saying to you, wake up. But he goes on. Let's look at verse 12. Verse 12 says this The night is nearly over, and the day is near. So let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So i got another rhetorical question for you. If God said to you, put away darkness, what would it be talking about? Again, rhetorical. I'm not asking you for confession right now. You can talk to me later. I'd be happy to listen to you. But if God said to you, put off the deeds of darkness, what's he saying to you? So I, I take this analogy again, right? He said, wake up. I'm thinking of my kids getting ready for school. And then I think of what happens. Right. Not only are, not only is my daughter up early and my boys struggle to get out of bed when they're supposed to be, but but something else happens when I'm asking them to get dressed. Right. When me and Danielle are like, hey, it's time to go upstairs, get dressed. Well, for my daughter, she's going to be in there already getting dressed like she has the door closed and she's going to spend like 30 minutes picking out the right outfit. She's going to put like five different. Uh, no, that's an underestimation. And I don't know how many outfits. I don't even know where she gets all the clothes. I don't remember buying them, but but like. <laughs> She's going to be in there putting on stuff, and then occasionally she'll come down. I'll see what she's wearing. I'm like, uh-uh, back upstairs. Uh, you ain't wearing that. Uh, but to my boys, I'll walk upstairs, and I'm telling you, it is not an unusual thing just to see a little boy on his underwear, like laid out like a star, in his underwear, laid out like a starfish on the floor. Like, do you not know what it means to get dressed? 
What are you doing? You're just laying there on the floor. Did you really think that's what we wanted you to do? They're like, no, I was just thinking. Or They always have an excuse, right? They always, they always have something that they're doing that was so important. But I'm like, no, I was watching you. You're just laying in your underwear on the floor. And second thought, get off my, under, uh, off my floor in your underwear. Like, what are you doing? I don't want that on my floor. Get off my... So, so that's a continual uh, process. All right, we've all had those instances where we... Um, we had times where we just had to, we had to get up, we had to get going, and we had to put something off. What's interesting about this passage, if you look at verse 12 again, it says, The night is nearly over and the day is near, so let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. It's really interesting how it says it. It's similar, we're going to read Colossians 3 in a second, but it's very similar to that passage that we covered several weeks ago, where it's speaking about characteristics like their clothing. And for those of you here, you may remember this, and for those of you who weren't, uh, I'll say it again. It, it's, it's very, it's like a great picture for us to think of, of our personality. Because what I asked when I taught this before, if you think of like someone that you don't like very much, think of someone who like really gets under your skin. Well, what is it they did to you? You, you probably don't think of one thing if you have really negative feelings. You think of, oh, they always do this, or I don't know, they just irritate me. But then you think of someone who's joyful and you're like someone who you're like that you're always like, man, I'm just excited to see that person. Well, what is it? Maybe they're excited to see you. They're friendly. They're welcoming. Uh, they compliment you, something like that. But what's interesting is what has become their actions has actually transformed in your mind to how you view them. Their actions became essentially their clothing. Their actions became essentially something they wear. And so I want you to think about that, like how people view you it's like your clothing. It's like if someone walks out with just this hideous outfit and uh, just a tip for, or kind of insider information for me and my wife when uh, she knows by now that if she doesn't want my opinion, honestly, don't ask. Like, don't ask me. I have, I have real difficulty being dishonest. I could try to be tactful, but if, if she's wearing something, she knows that I don't like things that look like curtains. Like if it's, or wallpaper, like if it's a floral pattern and she loves floral pattern, I'm like, I'll be honest, like you asked me, but it looks like a curtain. So I don't know what to say. So she knows now not to ask me that type of thing. But it's like if someone just like walked outside with this hideous outfit, you'd have a thought about them, right? It's the same thing with our characteristics. When you walk around this world, the way you treat others, the, the the personality you bring, the attitude you bring, all of those things are what people begin to develop in their mind about who you are. So that's why it's so important when we think of things beyond even just our personality and attitude and we think about character. Look what it says in Romans chapter 13, verse 12 again. It says, The night is nearly over and the day is near, so let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. If God is saying to you right now, or if, if He were to just... Uh, speak to you tonight and say, it's time to discard some things. It's time to get rid of some things. What's he saying to you? Like, what is it? I don't, I'm not asking you to answer me. I'm asking you to think about what's he saying to you to get rid of? And if he's saying it's time to put on some things, what's he saying to you to put on? You see how I'm saying uh, this, the title for this message is what would you wear if you meet God? What would you wear if you went to meet God? He doesn't care about your clothes unless they're inappropriate, I guess, but he doesn't need you to wear a tie. He didn't need you to wear a sports coat. He does care about your character. He cares about your holiness. He cares about those things. If I'm standing for God, I'd rather be in PJs and dressed in holiness. The way I act is what I become in the view of other people, and it's how God sees me as well. Now, He's going to see you if you're a Christian through the blood of Jesus Christ, but that doesn't mean He's blind to whether a child of His is living like a child of His or not. So I want us to look at a few passages. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8 says this. It's in your paper. It says, But now put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Now, I just want to pause there and see if you find yourself on that list anywhere. Put away all the following. Anger, wrath, malice, slander. If you don't know what some of those words are, anger and wrath. So anger, you know that one. Wrath, where you like um, get retribution on people, where you go um, 
try to get even, right? You're trying to do that against people. Malice is kind of those two combined. Slander, you're saying bad things. You gossip about someone. Filthy language from your mouth. Filthy language isn't just cuss words. It's, well, it could be like using the Lord's name in vain, but it's, it's way more than that. It's things that tear down, condescend. It's uh, perverted talk. It's like all sorts of things that could come from your mouth that don't honor God. Look at verse 9. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with, with its practices and have put on the new self. You hear that kind of clothing talk again? It's like, it's like you have these outfits of holiness or unholiness, and you, you're putting one of them on. So it says, middle of that verse, he says, You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your Creator. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on. Now he's going to give you some stuff to put on. It's this clothing again, though. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. I want you to hear that tonight, the things that God wants you not to wear and the things He wants you to wear. If you were to go before God and you wonder, what would I wear to meet God? And just realize now, I wasn't talking about clothing. I'm talking about that God sees you at this very moment and He knows the sin in your life and there's things that you have in your life that, that they essentially become who you are to other people, let alone before God. And if you're standing before Him, He already knows all the things that you're wearing. And He says, put that off. Discard it. Throw it down like it's, like it's the worst outfit you've ever wore, because it is. And put on good stuff. Now this is talking to a Christian, because if you're not a Christian, all the behavior change in the world doesn't save you. Only Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, accepting that for forgiveness of, of your sins, only that saves you. This is talking to Christians. If you know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, He's saying, quit walking like you're in the darkness still. Walk in the light. And we could say, well, I have difficulty with that. right? I, I have, I have this, this tendency toward this, toward that. And I, I have difficulty, um, man, I've got a vulnerability. Like, I really struggle with that. Okay, God understands struggle. He's not saying you won't struggle. He's saying keep struggling, though, right? He's, he's saying don't just give in to it and say that's just the way I am because God didn't save you to keep you the way you are. He saved you so you could be more, that you could live for Him, that through the blood of His Son you could find redemption and freedom from your sins. That's why He saved you. That's good. He didn't save you to stay how you are. So He says put away these things, put on this other stuff. But then He talked about in Romans chapter 13, verse 12 again, He says not just dis discard the deeds of darkness, but put on the armor of light. I want to talk to you about armor. It's mentioned numerous times in Scripture. The Apostle Paul really likes uh, armor. So I'm just going to read Ephesians 6. It's on your paper there. Uh, the armor of God. It's a famous passage. And I want to talk to you about what these are. Ephesians 6, verse 13. Look at it with me. He says, For this reason, take up the full armor of God. I like just that analogy, right? Because God is wanting you to know that there is a spiritual war going on. Right, And you don't have to be overly mystical to believe in a spiritual war. You could, you could just say, you know the struggles that you have. Right? If, you're, if you're ready to make an excuse, yeah, I'd like to live holy, but I have this vulnerability, this weakness, I, I've had trouble getting over, that's because you're in a war. That's because you have a very real enemy and also this flesh which wars against the Spirit. A very real spiritual war going on. And so that's why God says, put on the full armor of God. Oftentimes, we're trying to fight to live holy, and we're fighting without any armor or any offensive weapon. So he says, for this reason, look at verse 13 again, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything to take your stand. So you hear that. This is how you stand up. If you have a sinful desire, if you've got a, a weakness, maybe you, you, uh, you gossip, behind people's back. Maybe you're addicted to pornography. Maybe you're disrespectful to authority. I, I don't know what your, your situation is. I don't know what darkness that sometimes you find yourself clothed in. Everybody has one. There's not a single person in this room, including myself, that doesn't have very specific weaknesses that the enemy would use against us that we surrender into. But what he's saying is, you can resist by putting on the full armor of God. So look at verse 14. 
He says, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist. I love that. If uh, you ever seen anybody like try to run without a belt on and it all falls apart, right? Yeah. It's not, not a beautiful thing to watch. That's what the belt of truth is. That's what truth is. Truth is the thing that holds all the other things together. Truth is the thing that, that holds all the armor up. It, it's the thing that you need. You can have all the good intentions, but if you don't have truth, it's hanging on nothing. You need truth. You need this in your heart, in your life. You need to accept it here, accept it here. So it says, verse 14, Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest. Now I want to remind you, he told us to put on the armor of God, and righteousness is part of the armor. This implies that I'm not just a victim to my situation. That's how we feel when we're unrighteous, right? When we stumble into sin again and again, we feel like we're just victims to it. Well, I just can't help it. I'm just, I'm that way, I can't help it. I... Righteousness is one of the things we're told to put on. That means that to be holy, sometimes we have to go step out and show some strength and some resistance to a thing that we want to give into. And specifically here it says righteousness is like armor on your chest. So if you ever have difficulties with the faith or depression, you feel disheartened in your walk, oftentimes unrighteousness is the cause because righteousness is the thing that guards your heart. When I, when I go out and sin and I, I have a secret sin or, or maybe a very public sin sometimes, my heart's exposed because I've started to give my heart to another master when I should have given it to God. And when I, when I give my loyalty to God, my fidelity to God, my righteous living to God, it protects my heart. If you've had struggles of doubt, if you've had all sorts of depression that is sometimes, I'm not saying always, but sometimes sin caused, I'm certainly not saying always, but sometimes sin calls. If you had all sorts of situations where you just feel down, discouraged, separated from God, I want you to check your shield of righteousness, your breastplate of righteousness. See if your heart has been protected. Look at verse 15. And your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. So during this time, soldiers would have special sandals that they'd put on for war. It sounds crazy like that they didn't have boots and stuff, but I mean, we've, we've mastered uh, mass producing things, right? So they had sandals that were special ones that allowed them to advance on the enemy. And so what this is saying is there needs to be like, you ought to have your shoes like tied and ready to go to share the gospel of peace. So what it's saying is be eager have an urgency to evangelism. You ever think of evangelism as a thing that helps your spiritual walk? Like, we may not think of it like that. We may think of evangelism as something I'll do when I feel spiritual. That's not how Scripture describes it. Evangelism is an act of obedience. Some people have the gift of evangelism where they're better at it than the rest of us. But evangelism, the act, the verb, is an act of obedience. And it's part of the armor of God. It's one of the things that helps you stand in the evil day. It's one of the things that helps you be clothed in light and not clothed in darkness. So he says, uh, look at uh, verse 16 now. He says, In every situation take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So I describe it like this. If you think of a shield, it's the only thing that's not really attached to the rest of the stuff, right? It's the thing that floats around. So the difficulty is, of course, if you have gaps in your armor. So if, if an arrow comes through, it's going to hit you in a, a place that wasn't covered. So a shield is a thing that goes around and blocks the parts that are un uncovered, right? The other areas of vulnerability. And that's exactly what faith is. There are sometimes things that we don't understand. Sometimes, Generally, it's a thing that um, we can't see yet. Like, I can't see heaven yet. I can't, I can't fully understand all the promises of God yet, but I can have faith. I can trust Him. It's not that I, I need faith to believe He exists. The scripture makes clear that He could be seen through His nature. History attests of the person of Jesus Christ. There's enough evidence to believe that it's true, but that doesn't mean I receive His promise. And His promise of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ being sufficient for my sins, that's the thing I place my faith in. And so it doesn't feel like I should receive salvation. But He tells me if I have faith in Jesus Christ, I can. That's my shield. Okay, when, when there's been a week that I've been particularly sinful, 
particularly rude to someone, particularly stumbling back into an old sin that, that I wish I would get rid of, when I've had those moments, it doesn't feel like I should be saved. You've had those moments, I'm sure, that you feel like, I'm just going to have to pretend to be a Christian and hope I get in, because if everybody knew, they'd be like, oh, that's not a Christian. And God's saying, that's what you need the shield of faith for. 1 John 5.12, I quote this all the time, the one that has the Son has life, the one that has not the Son does not have life. My salvation is only dependent on whether or not I have Jesus Christ. That's it. It's not dependent on my behavior. Because if it were dependent on my behavior, every single one of us, we're in trouble. It's not. Now, saved people should live for Christ, but living for Christ uh, in, in just actions doesn't save us. Faith in Jesus Christ. So we have this shield of faith that quenches all the fiery darts because by trusting the promises of God, I protect my vulnerabilities. All right, so let's look back at the paper. He says in every, uh, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. So the helmet of salvation, oftentimes people think that just means to be saved. I covered this a couple weeks ago. That's actually not what it means. The helmet of salvation is really, as, um, as 1 Thessalonians calls it, it's a helmet of the hope of salvation. So yes, you need to be saved, but, but this is assuming you're a Christian already. So what the hope of salvation is, it's a right perspective. It means that as I've gone through life and faced a difficulty, a, a sad time, um, so, something terrible happened in my life, that I have an eternal perspective so it shields my mind. So because I know that heaven is real and I can go there one day or that when I lose a loved one, they're there now with God, it protects my mind. Or, or if I'm going through a, a difficult time at work or school and I have all these stresses on me, well, I can just remember this isn't my home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best here. I'm going to live for God, but this isn't my home. Heaven's my home. That perspective shields my mind. So this says, look at verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. When I, when I have that eternal perspective, it protects me just like a helmet protects the head. And it says, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The only offensive weapon it's been called is the Word. So you hear all these different things that he says to put on. Did you hear it in, and you can see on your paper still, Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 through 14. These are things that God tells us to put on. So I want to go back to Romans chapter 13. Let's read verse 11 and 12 again. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 and 12, with all of that in mind. Romans chapter 13, look at verse 11. Besides this, since you know the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep, because now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the day is near, so let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Do you hear what God is saying to you? He first told you to wake up, and now He's telling you, remove darkness and put on light. He said, wake up, and the second point on your notes, remove darkness and put on light. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what the darkness side is. I don't know what things God would have you get out of your life. You know it, though. If God came to you tonight, where you're getting ready for bed, and said to you, it's time to wake up, and it's time to get rid of the, the dark things in your life, the things that you're clothing yourself in that I see on you and the world sees on you, and that's how you look to everybody else. But that's not who I died to make you be. I died, Jesus Christ died, so that you could be clothed in light. So you could live a life of holiness that is pleasing to Him. That if I were going to stand before God and say, what would I like to be wearing? I'm telling you, it would be righteousness. It'd be a life lived for Him that He could say, well done, good and faithful servant. And it, I want that because knowing the time is near, whether, whether He's coming back or whether I'm going to die uh, tomorrow or in 60, 80 years, whatever, no matter what, the time is short compared to eternity. And God is saying, wake up and be clothed properly. Let's look at verse 13. He, said, he says, let us walk with decency as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy. So, you kind of get the point about what it would look like to dress decent before God. I love that it used that word, let us walk with decency. Because like, we've seen people who are dressed indecent. 
I've had uh, two instances in my life where I wasn't wearing the right thing. So one time I was an Air Force contractor and uh, I, I worked for this company and it was like a startup tech company. And so there were only like 10 people. I was like employee number eight. So if you say you're gonna go meet the president of the company, like if you were working for some, a huge company, you'd be like, oh, that's a big deal. But when there's 10 of us, I'm like, come on, I'm number eight. That makes me sound important too, right? And so we said, oh, what are we supposed to wear at the supper? And our boss said, oh, you could wear business casual. So business casual does not mean a suit and tie. That means like I get to wear my khakis and like dad golf shirt, right? And so, so that's usually the type of thing I wear. So I show up to this thing. Well, my boss and then the president of the company are in like three-piece suit, like looking so good. And I'm like, Man, <laughs> like it's that moment where you're like, wow, I feel like a little kid who was invited to an adult meeting, and uh, yeah, that's me right now. So I had that moment, and then uh, there was another guy with me who, he was also not dressed appropriately, and his looked like they had been stashed in the back of his car for like a month, so, his were, so he actually got chewed out more than me, but we both got chewed out. And there was this other time, I don't know if I should share this, but... Um, there's this other time. So when I first joined the Air Force, someone said do it. Someone said so, <laughs> tell it. And they're like, no shame. All right. Uh, so when, I, when you first join the military, you go through uh, the delayed entry program. Then you go through the military entrance processing, whatever it's called, MEPS. Um, and so I went to MEPS, and, um, and like on the way to basic training, they, they gave me this list. And there's all these people who are going to basic training with me. We're all leaving. I went to, I was in Iowa. I don't know why that was the station I ended up going to, but I flew out from Iowa. And so I've got like, I don't know, 15 other people with me, something like that. And I was like, I was told the day before, like, you're in charge of all these people. Make sure they get there. I'm like, <laughs> like I just... I just joined the military, like I'm in charge of these people. So I got this whole roster and uh, I'm supposed to check every stop, make sure everybody gets on, okay, I do that. Then get down to basic training and they do what they do. They're like screaming at you and stuff. So you forget all about all those people. Well, apparently there was this girl that she was on my flight and I, I didn't remember anybody's name after that because I was watching all of them. I guess they knew who I was because I was the one guy who they were supposed to check in with. And so I get to my base here at Scott and, uh, and so somehow she found out I was there and I was living in the dormitory at the time. And I had, I had like 103 fever and I also took NyQuil. And how many people here, like if you take NyQuil, it knocks you out? Like some of you, raise your hand if it doesn't do anything to you. Yeah, so I'm the type of person that medicine works on. Like if somebody ever wanted to roofie me, I'd be out, like <laughs> maybe for a month. And so NyQuil, NyQuil knocks me out. And so, so I'm, I'm wearing like basketball shorts and that's about it. And, uh, and so I'm 103 temperature. I mean, I was sick. And NyQuil, so I'm like a zombie. I mean, I mean like don't try to have a coherent conversation. So I'm like passed out in my dorm room and all of a sudden I hear a banging on my door. Like I guess they were just knocking, but it felt like a banging on my door. And so I get up and like, I don't even think about what I'm wearing. I don't think that I'm not dressed decent. I may be exaggerating a little bit by even saying I have bo uh, basketball shorts on. May not. <laughs> but so I'm like, I'm like so out of it. And I open this door and there's these two girls there and they're like. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but I, I still barely remember it. I'm only, I'm only like 50% certain it wasn't a dream. I was so out of it. Like, like I was pretty messed up. And so, so like I answer this door and I don't even remember a conversation, anything. They just kind of, I'm pretty sure they ran away from my door. And so like I, I shut it, went back to bed. Like when you show up to something not decently dressed, it is embarrassing. Like it is, it is a bad moment in your life. I remember those two times in my life. And so here's what I'm saying to you tonight, if I could bring it back to something spiritual, is that someday stand before God, it's not going to matter if you're wearing pajamas or something. It's going to matter if you're dressed decent in holiness. So look what this says. Look at chapter 13, verse 30. And he, he says, let us walk with decency as in the daytime. Then he names some things. He says, not in carousing and drunkenness. So um, some translations have a very interesting uh, translation of the word carousing. But essentially, it means a wild party. Some people translate it much stronger than that. I'm not going to talk about that. But um, not in carousing and drunkenness. So not in a wild party or drunkenness. Right? So this is one of the things that Scripture is saying to throw off of us. 
It's saying this isn't a decent way to live. This isn't what God wants from you. If that's been you, that you're just living a wild life, getting drunk, um, just living crazy, just realize that's not dressed decent before God. As God sees you, He sees those things, and that's not what you ought to be wearing before Him. Look at the next one. Not in sexual impurity and promiscuity. Man, there is a, there's just such a long list of ways to be sexually impure nowadays. Right? I mean, there's just such a long list. And what you may think is, I have to do this or that to be happy. I'm telling you, you're substituting happiness for joy, which is found in God. Yeah, it, it'll give you fleeting happiness. But oftentimes, as you surrender yourself to sexual immorality, you're going to find that it is a well that runs dry that you have to go back to again and again, and you're never satisfied, and it, it impacts your, your emotions. Right? So things like pornography, they, they find that people oftentimes, just like any addiction, they find that people become very short-tempered, go through times of depression. Sexual impurity and promiscuity, man, it's, it's rampant in our society. So it's not uncommon for Christians to um, sleep around, to be addicted to pornography, to um, be in same-sex relationships, to um, what, whatever. It, it's not uncommon. I know I have counseled men who have cheated on their wives. It, it's not uncommon, but it's wrong. Right? And this isn't saying that you as a human ought to feel just terrible about yourself and, and just condemn. Not at all. There's a, there's a God who sent His Son to die to save you from those things. And this isn't the only list of sin in here. Wild drunkenness and uh, sexual immorality. Those aren't the only things in Scriptures that God says we ought not be clothed with, but they are on the list. And so when God in heaven sees you wearing these things as your clothing, He's not saying, I hate you for it. He's saying, if you know me, if you're my child, I want you to dress different. It's like when my kids come downstairs, there's some expectation I have that as they go out into the world, I want them to wear certain things because they represent my family. And if you're a child of God, you represent Him. And He says, there's ways you ought to live your life. There's things that ought to be in your life and things that ought not be in your life. So He goes on, He says, not quarreling and jealousy. It's really interesting because Christians are pretty quick to pick on things like drunkenness and sexual immorality, right? Right? Quarreling and jealousy. Just realize those are on the list too. Picking fights lately with a friend, with a family member, got jealousy over someone in your life. This isn't an exhaustive list, meaning there's more to it than just this. But these are things that God says, that's not what you're to be clothed in. So the next point, point three, since you know the time, walk in decency. Walk in decency. And the last one is this. Look at verse 14. But put on, again the clothing talk, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make plans to gratify the desi desires of the flesh. So the last point on your paper, since you know the time, make yourself like Jesus. Do you hear what this says to you tonight? That the time is short, whether because Christ will return soon or whether because this is supposed to be the age of light because we now have the gospel, or whether because you're going to die sometime and we're not promised tomorrow, but, but even if you live uh, maybe an unnaturally long life, maybe you're one of the people who reaches 100, great, you're already a fifth of the way done. I, I mean, just really. Th this world is fleeting. He will return one day, and if He doesn't return before we die, then we'll stand before Him anyways. And so it says, since you know the time, the hour, since the night is nearly over, the day is near, He says, Christian, wake up. Christian, put off the deeds of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Christian, walk in decency. Put away all those things and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Scripture says to you tonight. So I want to do something very specific tonight. I want to call you to assess what you're wearing before God right now. Not your, not your clothes. Hopefully you have an awesome YA shirt on. Not that. I want you to think about if God is examining you, maybe there's some things that are negative in your life that God's saying, wake up, it's time to quit that. Maybe there's some things, not as much negative, but there's some things that are positive that you're not doing. Maybe it's service to Him. 
Maybe it's a daily devotion in your Word. Maybe it's prayer. Maybe it's sharing your faith, evangelism, with someone that's in your class or, or at your work. Maybe God's saying wake up because you've never trusted Him as, a, as your Savior. So what I want to do right now is I'm going I'm to close this in prayer. The band's going to play. I'm going to ask everybody to go ahead and just bow their head, close their eyes. And I want you to do business with God. You can do it right there in your seat, or as always, you can come up to the altar. You're welcome to, to come up here and pray. But I want you to do business with God. And it doesn't have to be this huge guilt trip of a thing. It's just God wanting you to live for Him. Like a, like a child who wants to please their father, that's all it is. Is God, I've had some things that I'm struggling with, and God, I want, I want to surrender it to You. Or God, maybe I'm not struggling too much, but I've been pretty lazy for you. I haven't, I haven't stepped out in my faith at all. I, I just kind of look the Christian part, but I'm not serving. Or, or there's a person in my life that I know they don't know Jesus Christ, and I ought to witness to them. I'm asking you tonight to do that. I'm praying that as people return from school, as we get new people this summer, I'm praying for a revival. And revival starts with us. Let's pray. Father God, I put this before the people here tonight. You tell us to wake up and to clothe ourselves in righteousness, to put away the evil things, the things of the, the darkness of the old self, to put on light. It is difficult, God. Sometimes there's some things we want in our life that shouldn't be there. And sometimes there's things that you want in our life that we don't really want to exert the energy to do. But you say, since we know the time, since it's nearly there, since one day everybody will stand before an almighty God and give account for how he's lived his life, then lost people and Christians alike, you say to us, because of these truths, we know what manner of people we ought to be. And there is probably someone in here tonight who has never given their life to you. I want to tell them how right now, God, right now, they could confess your, their sins before you and just say, Jesus, I admit I am a sinner. And I know that my sin separates me from you. But I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose again. I give my life to you, God, and ask you to forgive me. And if someone prayed that, then at this very moment they pass from death to life. I pray, God, for someone sitting here tonight who doesn't know you, maybe didn't pray it yet, that's not their only opportunity. I would be happy to share how to be saved afterward. But I pray that they not leave this place without making a decision to live for you. Because you are a real God who spoke this world into existence out of the water and in the water and even judged it by the water. Because you are a God who intervenes in the affairs of men. And thank goodness you do because you intervened in our sin. Because we are lost and apart from you. But you died to save us. And so I'm asking for someone here tonight who doesn't know you, to surrender to you tonight, to give their life to you and receive eternity. And I pray for my Christians here tonight who that passage is really written to because it's written to people who know the time. We're not children of the darkness. We're children of the light that we need not be overtaken by surprise when the thief comes in the night. We may not know the day or the hour, but we know you're coming, God. And knowing you're coming means we ought to live for you. So God, right now, there's probably someone who has been dealing with a secret sin. And I pray that they confess it to you right now. And they receive your forgiveness. And I pray, God, that you help them in their struggle, but I also pray they pursue righteousness by putting on the whole armor of God. Because they may have been just trying to quit a habit instead of trying to live for holiness. 
And there is a difference. It is hard to just quit something. It is empowering to live for something. So God, I pray for my Christians in this room tonight who need to live for you, who need to put on the whole armor of God, who need to have the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the feet of the preparation of the gospel of peace, the sword of truth, the belt of truth. And they put it all on by prayer. God, I pray for Christians tonight to cast those things aside and to put on Christ's likeness. I pray that people don't leave tonight without giving those things to you. And knowing that from here on out, they won't be perfect, but to live for you, to continually go back, to confess sin, because as we confess sin, you are faithful and just to forgive and cleanse all unrighteousness. Above all, God, I pray that people don't leave here without doing the business that you have for them to do. If there is something on their heart, don't let them push it away. Don't let their heart harden to it. Soften their heart. Open the heart's door. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.